Hello all, welcome to our first lecture in week one. Um, this week we're going to be talking about the Elizabethan Poor Law in Colonial America. Um, this is kind of the root of our class. Uh, it talks about um, where our current practices come from, um, how do we deal with destitute people, criminals, orphan children, the mentally insane, um, where do some of our ideas for modern practices come from? Um, how much of it is government agencies versus private agencies? And uh, we're going to focus a lot on the history of that and if those are new practices or variations on old practices. Um, we're going to talk about the roots of our belief system with the poor and the criminals. Um, some of our lectures and forum discussions in GHIS. Uh, 205 will answer these questions um, and you're going to see that as, as we go on but this week is just very basic roots okay so as I mentioned we're going to be looking at Elizabethan Poor Law um, the English Elizabethan Poor Law of 1601 uh, was the foundation for the American colonial welfare system um, clearly most of you will have already had basic American history and understand that um, while we do see a lot of settlers um, from different areas, really the colonies and the settlement part of America um, was mostly English. Um, the French do have some outposts in Canada, other areas, but uh, they will focus mostly on fur trading and other kinds of trading and they won't actually have the same kind of colonial setup. Um, same with the Spanish. Um, so with the exception of the Dutch in New York, um, some Huguenots from French, a few, um, the majority of the English settlers, or the majority, excuse me, of early settlers from the American colonies um, in the 17th and early 18th century. Um, they were born in, in Britain and uh, they're very proud of their British heritage, you know, early on they um, they really embrace uh, their culture and their traditions that they bring over from uh, the British. Um, all, of the col all of the colonists brought some religious and social traditions, including their views on how to deal with and respond to poverty. Um, I'm just going to include slideshows uh, while we do this. Um, you can always check out these slideshows. I'll also upload them in the classroom um, so that you guys can get a closer look at some of the images and uh, pieces that I'll put out here. Uh, English poor law, poor law, excuse me, from the 16th and early 20th century was a response to population growth, rural migration, and industrialization that had changed the landscape of England. Now, as I've mentioned in this class, we assume that you have a background in American history. Um, during this period, um, America, or excuse me, England will be going through the Industrial Revolution, which will really urbanize a lot of areas. Um, with new urban areas, it becomes a lot of different working conditions, living conditions, and a lot more poor. Um, the population's been shifting from very rural, rural to growing urban society and uh, the economic demands of the growing industrial society result in this uh, new mobility and that produces vagabonds, sturdy bakers, and tramps um, which have no home base. Um, the law reflect the belief in building the strong sufficient economy was critical to an economic advancement and social stability. Uh, so one of the, the ideas is they really believed they have to deal with what's going on with the poor in order to grow their economy. They, and there's a feeling that we need everyone to be working. Um, so people could not be left just to wander around. They needed to, to be able to be productive and the concern was, um, that they might prey on citizens. Now I'm sure that you're going to be able to make some great connections to how we see things today versus how we saw things then and you're going to be able to see that that really a lot of our ideas come from this moment. 
uh, the law was intended to ensure that towns and cities assumed responsibility for assisting people in need. And uh, they were not always just supposed to uh, help them out, but, you know, like I said, make sure they're productive members of society. Um, a unique feature of the law was the consideration of worthy versus unworthy poor. Uh, worthy poor include orphans, widows, handicapped, the frail, and the elderly. Um, there was an, an idea of Christian support for them because they're unable to care for themselves. Excuse me. Um, so the difference would be, as I'm sure you can see, is that they're unable to provide for themselves. They might be unable to work. Um, whereas the unworthy poor um, include drunks, shiftless vagabonds. Um, the English clearly believed in the virtue of hard work and um, they were concerned about people who would not work and contribute to the community. Um, the consideration of who to help and how to help was often based on that perception. Um, and though the terms will change, you're going to see a lot of the same theme as we go throughout the class. Um, I've also included a link to the social welfare project that you're supposed to read. You'll also find a lot of this stuff in the handouts and the reading sections of our class, um, just so you have an idea of where to look. Um, uh, whereas England was dealing with a massive mobility, uh, some of who were in demand only seasonally, the predominantly rural America colonies faced different challenges. So America, clearly because um, they have more land, they are more rural, they are going to face different challenges than England did. But we have to remember that the settlers who come over are dealing with a lot of these same perceptions, so they will be looking at how to implement these ideas into their, their new world. Um, so the settled communities force the death of its citizens uh, constantly. Contagious diseases like smallpox, dysentery, and medicine decimated families. Women gave birth to an average eight times in their life. Um, not all women survived. This was, you know, clearly a different time medically. Um, Wars with the Indians uh, in early settlement days uh, left survivors in desperate need of support. Um, and life at sea uh, could often mean the loss of life or limb. Um, it was a brutal time um, settling and colonizing America. Um, children were at risk, so children often grew up without a mother. Um, injuries did not er easily mend. Um, so men could not always support their families, and resources could be quickly depleted so that families often faced destitution uh, in early colonial life. Um, all of these catastrophes resulted in orphans, widows, frail elderly, and disabled people in need of assistance. So we're going to um, see how the colonies deal dealt with this idea of worthy poor. Uh, while they still lived in small groups, communities could often care for each other. Orphans were placed where they would uh, serve as apprenticeships or indentured servants. Indentured servitude is a very important idea in the American colonies. Uh, the agreement to take an orphan in would uh, it could be driven by a desire to provide for the well-being of a future citizen, an opportunity to obtain additional resources through an indentured servitude contract. So um, they might just need help. I One of the issues with the American colonies is there's an issue of overcrowding in England, but in the American colonies there's almost an issue of not enough people. There's a real demand for labor. Um, so an indentured servitude was a way for someone to obtain labor in a hopefully cheaper fashion was their goal. Able-bodied men and women who could not support themselves were expected to work in some capacity in the community. Um, usually indentured ship on a farm or in um, some other labor industry. Um, 
Okay. At this time, um, people who were in need to receive assistance without earning it, um, this approach is a reflection of the English Poor Law uh, for striving for an orderly society. Communities did accept responsibility for meeting their neighbors' needs, and much of that response had religious overtones. So, um, when we talk about private institutions, we're talking about churches and generally religious charities. Uh, this response to the needy was driven by the religious belief that one's status in the world was a reflection of the endowed grace and that there were expectations to help the less fortunate. So, that God granted you your position and you were then expected to take care of others. Um, they viewed their privilege and fortunate status as an opportunity to do good. Voluntary contributions gradually evolved over time um, to forms of local taxation. Because for some of the societies, uh, like Puritans and some other colonial societies, they were very based on religion and religious ideas, which meant that uh, they agreed and they had religious communities as well. Um, the 13 colonies had different social, economic, political systems, so we're making some broad statements here. Um, but at the same time, we can't make broad statements because the North and the South and different regions were actually very different. Um, uh, they shared a common approach to public assistance. Uh, depending on the community church, wardens or the designated substantial householders, they served as overseers to collect the taxes, distribute the funds, and determine public response to the people who needed it. They had the power to determine who received funds and who would be placed out. Um, so really, in some ways, they were just the final arbitrators of who was the worthy and unworthy poor, who was going to get the assistance. Um, as the population grew and became more complex, the needs of the people imposed a greater demand on the society no longer could a local system of support suffice, and communities sought more permanent regulated forms of relief. Some colonies, uh, some colonies require confirmation that servants would be supported by the family who went, they went to work with if they became ill or unable to work. So um, what they hoped was that able-bodied people who went to work for someone um, if they became disabled or they became a part of the worthy poor where they weren't able to work, the family would take care of that need, um, take care of them into their elderly age, take care of all those needs so that they wouldn't then go back to being a burden on the community. Uh, another response to the emergence of cities and the growing number of impoverished people in the middle of the 18th century was the development of workhouses and almshouses. Um, Uh, early assistance was provided by people in their homes and was known as outdoor relief because people could get assistance outside of any kind of institution. So the relief was actually in the communities as opposed to gathering everyone into a relief house, which is what we'll see down the road. Uh, it took the form of food, fuel, possible money, but was never particularly generous. This was not meant to set people well off. This was meant really to prevent them from starving to death. Um, as populations grew and people began to migrate from one community to another, institutions came for, became the preferred option um, and were known as indoor relief because the assistance took place inside an establishment. Elderly citizens were more likely to receive assistance in their home, while younger able-bodied men and women were sent to workhouses or to indentured servitude. Um, because, as I mentioned, often those were farmhouses, but that was not the only way. Uh, indentured servitude could also take place in industries. Um, especially in the north, we'll see uh, the growth of shipmaking and other kinds of industries. And uh, indentured servitude could actually be a good option because not only would they experience care at the moment, um, but for them it was also a possible career down the road. Uh, so this is the development of the uh, Elizabethan Poor Law. And what's important is uh, to understand that this is something that starts in England. It's an idea that starts in England. 
And what we're going to see as the British come over with a lot of their culture and politics and ideas is we're going to start with what is a very British system um, and what really develops over there. And then we're going to take it to the colonies. And because the colonies are going to be a slightly different uh, organization, as I said, they're, that, you know, even the North will be more rural than Britain. You know, they'll have more of a demand for labor. Uh, things will be slightly different. Um, we'll see that as, as how, how things change with the, the American colonies. Um, every uh, lecture, I'm going to provide references. These are references for where my information comes from. Um, these are also references from where I get my little pictures and other things that I include in PowerPoint and my spoken lecture. So, you know, feel free to check those out. Um, they have a lot of great information about the topics we're talking about. Um, they have a lot of great visual evidence and hopefully it'll give you a chance to investigate our topics a little more every week. Thanks. You guys have a great week.